Hey guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. It is Q&A Tuesday. So if you are brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue, I'm a medical coder. I have been a medical coder for over 10 years. I really love sharing the things that I know in a very honest and upfront way <laughs> about medical coding and the lifestyle and what all goes into it. Uh, so I hope you'll take a second, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, and at the end of this video helps you, I hope you will share it. Okay, so let's get started, all right. What is Q&A Tuesday? Q&A Tuesday is a show where I take all the questions that you submit from e email, from Instagram, from uh, video comments, and I put it all into one episode, and here we go. So I wanna thank everybody who submitted questions. Thank you so much, and let's get started. All right, number one, I love typing, data analysis, and the medical field. I would like a living salary as well. I'm an introvert and it is very hard for me to get out of my shell and interact with people until I am comfortable with that person. Then I talk a lot. Do you think this would be a good career for me? So medical coding is more than just, uh, it, it's a very small percentage of typing, okay? Um, and it's, a, it's some data analysis, but it is mostly reading comprehension and it is really understanding what you're reading. And that is like the big part of it. As far as like, because you're an introvert, is this a good career field for you? It takes many different types of people, many different types of personalities to be medical coders. So yes, if you are an introvert or an extrovert, this is a career field for you. Because believe it or not, there are, <laughs> there are uh, this is a really good field for extroverts as well. A lot of people work in very quiet areas and they have like, offices and things like that but a part of what we do is interacting with the providers now as this viewer pointed out she says that as she starts to relax she'll get to talking and then she talks a lot <laughs> with the, her with people right so in this case it would be the providers who you would really need to start working on building relationships with to be a well-rounded coder we have to have a lot we have to know a lot we have to know about the coding and we have to have good people skills we have to have very good communication skills, which is why a lot of times when I communicate, I am very direct. I think being direct is, is more important and better than being somebody who sugarcoats things. I don't sugarcoat things very often, a lot at all, because I feel like if you're sugarcoating, then it's the eventual truth is going to come out. <laughs> so that's why I would rather just tell you right away. And in this case, yes, if you are introvert, don't worry, it's a field for you. If you're an extrovert, don't worry, it's a field for you, okay? <laughs> so next question. Does knowledge of Global Days, Global Surgical Package, apply to the CCS exam as well? If yes, what questions do they usually ask on the exam? CCS, if you don't know, is a certified coding specialist and that is offered with the American Health Information Management Association. The CCS credential says, basically, that you can code both inpatient and outpatient, that you understand the rules of inpatient coding and you understand the rules of outpatient coding because there is a difference between the two. Uh, there's a difference in the books that they use or the systems, right? So uh, with inpatient, it's the PCS. With outpatient, it's the CPT book. And a lot of this is a lot of knowledge, okay? To have the CCS is the gold standard. I call it the gold standard uh, because it says in one credential that you can code both inpatient and outpatient. Now, um, as far as having to know this, you have to know this, yes. And as far as like what specific questions are on the test, I don't know. AHIMA has a very high standard when it comes to their testings, so nobody knows the questions, okay? You're not going to know until you get into there and you're taking the test. Um, so my advice to you is to study over everything. If you are in a CCS program, make sure you're reviewing everything. If there's something that doesn't make sense to you, and if you're studying to take your exam, make sure that you keep going over it until you understand it. There are many avenues to helping you to understand these things. There's other videos on YouTube. I don't watch other medical coders videos because I want my content to stay clean. <laughs> um, so if you do other research and you find other channels, that's fine. But as far as like uh, really trying to understand everything that you need to know, you're gonna to have to understand basically what is on the, the test, right? So 
If you are using a uh, CCS prep manual, which I always recommend to use the prep manuals, whether you're taking any certification exam, because this is going to prep you and it's going to at least give you some practice. OK, so that is that is the whole idea behind those prep books. But yes, that would be what I would recommend that you learn. Next one is, do you recommend Penn Foster? It is an online billing and coding course. So when it comes to specific um, trade schools online, like Penn Foster, I can't really recommend it because I didn't go to Penn Foster, okay? The only thing I can recommend is going to the online programs for either AHEMA, the American Health Information Management Association, or through AAPC, the American Academy of Professional Coders. Each one of these associations are the major medical coding association powerhouses, okay? They have online medical coding programs on both of these. The reason that I recommend these is because it is directly with the associations themselves. There is no middleman. <laughs> and a lot of times the, the cost difference, right, between going to an online program with the associations versus going to a trade school, it, it, it is like night and day difference because the trade schools often charge way high amount for what you would have gotten the same if you just would have went to the online version of the school through the associations. It is a fraction of the cost, but the trade schools have to make money, you know, so that is why they, there are some markups. And sometimes uh, there's sometimes there's job placement assistance. Uh, sometimes you may have a good instructor. Now, I will warn you of this. Not all instructors are created equally. Some instructors that work at trade schools are basically proctoring from a book, sometimes because they are like basically bound by the school that this is how you will teach this course. Some of them, it is just because it is easier to just uh, teach from straight from a book. Basically, the student can read it themselves. And sometimes certain uh, instructors are not going to teach you those critical thinking skills. Now, if you can find instructors that will teach you critical thinking skills, that will be good because it'll prepare you for the outside world. But there's really no guarantee unless you're actually interviewing the school and you're interviewing the people. And I always strongly recommend that because the thing is, they're taking your money. You are financially responsible to this school for this program. Once you sign on the dotted line, they got your money, okay? So you got to make sure that you're going to get something out of it if you decide to go to a trade school. As far as Penn Foster goes, I have heard some of my viewers have had success with Penn Foster. And the only thing I can recommend is if you insist on going to an online trade school or some trade school, just make sure that they are training you for either AHIMA, the American Health Information Management Association, or AAPC, the American Academy of Professional Coders, make sure that you're training you for one of these associations. Sometimes they say we train you for both. You know, you can sit for the CCA with the HEMA, or you can sit for the CPC. If, you, if that is the case with that school, then that is totally fine. If that is what you feel comfortable with going to that school, then that's okay, because that is what you want. If it is not, <laughs> if the trade school is teaching you something about medical coding and they do not mention a HEMA or AAPC, get out of there. Because uh, if you are looking to be a medical coder, you have to have a credential through one of those associations. And if you don't believe me, just look on job listings and look and see what credentials they're asking for. And that'll answer your question for you. Okay, so uh, next question. Is medical coding the same as medical record technician or RHIT? I'm confused. Thank you very much. Okay, so RHIT is the Registered Health Information Technician. This is the associate's degree that is offered with the American Health Information Management Association. To get this, you have to go through a approved AHIMA program uh, through a college in order to get this. Not all, um, not all like health information programs are approved with the American Health Information Management Association. So for this, you have to be very careful because if you don't go through one of their approved programs, then you can't sit for the RHIT or if you're going for a bachelor's in health information management, you would not be able to sit for, our, for an RHIA um, if, if it's not approved with their association. Okay, now the RHIT, the 
The thing about them is they are basically the worker bee, to put it colloquially. Okay, <laughs> they are the worker bee. They are the supervisors, right? In in the department, they are like lead coders. That is what RHITs typically do. They do a lot more of the coding than somebody who has an RHIA. Somebody who has an RHIA or registered health administrator, health information administrator, registered health information administrator, uh, they are the ones that are working on the executive floor. They're the ones that are running the ship, basically. So that is their function. And the amount of coding that they do is is usually very little, okay? Because they are usually running the business side of the house. That is what RHIAs do. RHITs, they do a lot of the coding, so that answers that. But yes, uh, it it's just a associate's degree. Basically, is what it means. And sometimes certain employers will have you have the RHIT, plus they will want you to get a credential as well, like a CCS. Usually a CCS is what they want you to get in addition to. Um, so, it, and it's just them. I mean, to me, if I saw somebody with an RHIT who had previous coding experience, that wouldn't be a big deal to me. <laughs> but industry standards say <laughs> that sometimes they will need an additional credential as well. So, it just depends on wherever you're applying or wherever your company says, you know. All right, next question. Hi, Ms. Blue. I badly need advice. I've read a lot of blog that the CCS exam is very hard and they said you have to have three years experience in medical coding in order to understand well the questions, especially the medical scenarios. And in my case, I have zero experience, but we're in training to get familiar, familiarized uh, with ICD-10, CM, PCS, and CPT codes. But still not confident to take the CCS and our company decided to let us take the exam on this July next month. Please help which part to focus and study tips. So when it comes to looking at blogs and looking at Facebook medical coding groups for advice, get out of there because everybody's going to have a different point of view. For some people, um, studying is difficult, especially with certain adults. They don't want to study and when they they go through a program and they take their exam and sometimes when they don't pass they will go and they will tell people how hard it is and things like that the ahima exams are some of the toughest in the industry i will say that these are you can look at the pass fail rates um, on the ahima website and it will tell you and it will give you an idea but these tests are not impossible and in order to stay focused on your goal, you need to cut out all the distraction because that's really all going to those other Facebook medical coding groups and listening to blogs and things like that. Those are all distractions. You need to stay focused on what you want. If you wanna pass a CCS, if you're in the program and you um, have been studying and things like that, stay focused on what you wanna do. Don't listen to anybody else, all right? You gotta stay focused and you gotta stay concentrated on your goals, okay? And what is the worst that can happen? You don't pass a test, okay? Well, the worst that can happen is you didn't pass the test. So what happens? You take it again. I've known many people who've had to take the test a few times because they get very nervous. And that is the, the problem sometimes with um, test taking tests, right? We get nervous and it just, that overcomes us and we let that get the better of us. The thing about it is, you're not going to have a 100% confidence, right? It's walking in every single time. And when it comes to taking your tests, you need to know the basics. You need to know the foundation. You're not really going to understand until you're out in the field coding what's really going on. So you may be able to pass the test, but still having to learn when you're out in the real world is another different story. But for the most part, when it comes to studying, and I've always recommended getting the exam prep books. I recommended uh, working on your speed because when you're looking at coding scenarios and, and what you're supposed to code and things, the faster you can get through, the better off you'll be because a lot of times people get hung up on those little details. And I always tell you guys, it's the details that will get you. And if you're sitting there second guessing yourself, instead of going through with your first initial thought like whatever the answer is, keep going, keep going, keep going. 
If you don't go with that first initial thought process, you're going to slow down. And a lot of people have complained that blue, I ran out of time. That was my whole thing. I ran out of time. Trust yourself, trust how you've been taught, trust your study time and all the effort that you've put into it and just go with your first gut instinct because this way you'll be able to have more time for the longer scenario questions and things like that. So just make sure that you're doing that and make sure that you are trusting what you think initially. Because as we all know, if we would just trust our gut instincts, we would be a lot better off, right? <laughs> At least I know that's that's the case for me. If, if a lot of times uh, before I, I fully understood that, um, I wouldn't trust my gut. I'd be like sitting there second guessing myself. And the second I started sec the second I started trusting my gut was when things started to flow a lot better because you're you're it's in there. It's in your mind, it's in your brain. You got it, okay? So that's all I gotta say on that one. All right. Next question. How do you know when to append a modifier? Is there something that pops up to let you know that the patient needs it? I'm sorry, I'm still learning and I'm wondering how do you know? So when it comes to when to add a modifier, when to add an evaluation and management level, when to add a procedure, it is all about interpreting the documentation and fully comprehending what you are reading. Now, I have been doing a few videos about modifiers. I did a modifier 57 video, which I believe this, this uh, question came off of. And I will leave those links down in the description box below. Again, it is going to take you comprehending what you're reading. Now, I always recommend that if you are looking at your CPT professional edition uh, by the AMA, that's the book you need when you are uh, taking your tests, right? <laughs> Either through a HIMA or AAPC, both of them require you to have the CPT AMA professional edition. Appendix A, I'm telling you guys, those appendixes are wonderful because they're chock full of information. Appendix A is the breakdown of all of the modifiers and it will tell you um, what, what, it, what that modifier is about, okay? So be sure to look at that and be sure to know because when you are familiar, when you familiarize yourself with those modifiers, it is really going to help you because those modifiers are telling more of the story, all right? So that's my answer on that one. <laughs> all right, next question. Where'd it go? Okay. I work as a medical collector in a billing office for several outpatient facilities. I am contemplating on which certification to start as a medical coder. I have heard CPC is my best bet. Will this be true? So when it comes to whether you should go with one association over the other, I am with AHIMA. Now, I have always given you guys information about both associations because I feel like there are certain things about both associations that are better for certain coders and better for other coders. So this is why I let you guys have your own choice. I would never tell you guys to, oh, only get this one or only get this one or only this one's better, or that one's better or anything like that. Whatever you decide, okay? And I always tell you guys to look at both associations because both of them have their pluses, all right? With the HEMA, they are the oldest and longest running. They are steeped in history. And with AAPC, there is many members. It is a, a large grassroots movement. And there is a lot, you know, there's a lot to both of them. There's a lot of positives to both of them. But when it comes to the test times, right? The test times vary between uh, both associations. With AHIMA, the, uh, the CCA is two hours, I believe. And then with, um, with AAPC, the CPC exam is five, and a half, five hours and 40 minutes. I always want to say five and a half. It's five hours and 40 minutes. So there's a difference in the test times there, okay? So that's why, you know, you really have to kind of look. Um, and there's other things with AAPC. They require their uh, people who are taking their exams to be members of their association. With AHIMA, they do not have that requirement. Uh, they have separate prices for members and non-members. So it really is going to depend. Uh, I would recommend that you look in your area to see what credential are they asking for the most, okay? And sometimes it's not going to be the CPC. Sometimes it's going to be a HEMA credentials or sometimes it is going to be uh, both. Uh, most times you will see both associations are accepted, okay? Because a HEMA and AAPC are the medical coding association powerhouses, so. All right, next question. 
Have you ever heard of National Healthcare Association? I found in tech school, they mention this association rather than AHIMA or AAPC. So when it comes to the National Healthcare Association, I personally do not know anything about them. Okay, that's number one. Number two, I know that if you want to be a medical coder, you have to have AHIMA or AAPC credentials. So if they're not offering that at that school, I would strongly suggest that you look at another school because I don't know anything about them. And I have been looking because uh, I've been doing these videos with you guys about explaining these uh, job listings for medical coders, which Friday's episode, <laughs> I have a tip for you guys and I'm so excited, but I'm only going to share it on that video. I can't wait to tell you though. I'm so excited. But, um, I've been doing these videos because a lot of times when you're looking at the language of these job listings, it gets a little confusing. And this is why I try to, to talk about it and explain it, the differences between required and preferred, <laughs> um, and all about the fact that you should just go ahead and apply anyway, regardless of the amount of experience that they're asking for. But um, there's more <laughs> on that episode coming up. But... Um, like I said, if you want to be a medical coder, they are only looking for AHIMA and AAPC credentials. So that is my advice on that one. Next question. Can an outpatient coder work in a hospital? Yes, I am an outpatient coder and I work in a hospital. Well, when I do work in a hospital, because right now we are still at home. <laughs> but uh, inpatient and outpatient coders can both work in hospitals because... Obviously, there is a inpatient floor, so you have your inpatient coders on the inpatient floor. But for the outpatient coders, there's outpatient clinics, right? There's orthopedics, there's podiatry, there's cardio, there's gastro, there's uh, ophthalmology, and and there's a lot. Of, there's everything. Okay, so we can coexist in the hospital all together, both inpatient and outpatient coders. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Uh. Hey Blue, are there free resources for self-study? Something to take a look at before committing to paying thousands of dollars for a career school or going through an association program. So you can study independently for uh, your medical coding credentials. With uh, AHIMA, it's the CCA, and with the uh, AAPC, it's the CPC. So I do have a separate video about that, talking about what you can study on your own if you are looking to uh, study to to study to be a medical coder independently. Uh, you can, I'll leave that link down in the description box below, but you can take a look through my videos. Uh, my entire channel is devoted to medical coding and what the lifestyle is like. I have a day in the life of a medical coder where I talk about my day. I have uh, motivation videos where I'm talking about uh, student motivation, where I'm talking about how to interact with providers. And so my entire channel is devoted to all of this information. So I would strongly recommend if you don't want to spend thousands of dollars, but you still want to know and you still want to see what this is like, take a look through my videos. Okay. Next question. If I get a CPC, I have read it will be in apprentice status. Is that even worth it? Apprentice status is a, a thing that is specific to AAPC. That is something that they have for every new CPC. And it just basically says that you are brand new. Now, there is a, a certain requirements that you have to meet in order to re have that A removed. You can look on the uh, AAPC website and it will tell you. It will tell you about the experience that is required or they have a program called Practicode, um, and that's basically coding, and it will, uh, a certain amount of records or something like that. Um, be sure to check the website and get that information from there. But yes, it is, a, it is a normal part, but don't worry, it gets removed after a certain amount of time, okay? Um, er, or requirements met. <laughs> How do you get involved with the HEMA? You become a member. <laughs> uh, if I got, Next one is, if I got certified in the state of Florida, where I am, would I have to get recertified in another state if I move? When it comes to medical coding, we do not have, it's not state to state, okay? It is, we have the National Association um, credential exams, and so our credentials are good everywhere, okay? They're even good overseas. I've known people who have moved overseas, and it just, their credential works just fine, okay? Next question, um, what place would be better 
employment, a hospital or a private owned facility. I asked because I was told that working for hospitals, you don't get paid as much as you should. So it really is going to depend on where you're applying. I have done many episodes about explaining job listings and from what I have seen, and of course what I know, um, that is that statement is simply not true. There are some hospitals that, that pay on the lower end. There are some that pay comparable to the area. There are some, there are some hospitals that pay very well. It depends if this is a public, private, or government hospital. There is a lot of different factors that go into it. I strongly recommend that you do not like pigeonhole yourself into only applying with private facilities. Be sure to apply everywhere, okay? And it will tell you, you know, how much they're offering. So, so don't automatically think that, oh, it's just gonna be um, that the hospitals don't pay well because that's just simply not true, okay? And then the last one is, uh, here we go. Sh- what should I do? Sh- what should I do first? Do I have to buy the books first before I register for an online course? And can we buy current books on Amazon? Okay, so if you want to know what's on Amazon, look on Amazon. And how are you supposed to know what books to buy if you're not even in the program yet? Okay, so it, when you get signed up with a program, sometimes programs include the books. If not, it will tell you what books you need and and where to go to find them usually and then you know then you can go from there ebay also has good deals on books optum360.com uh optum360coding.com has wonderful resources of books and for perfect for medical coders this is not an ad for optum360 but oh my gosh i love optum360 coding because of all of the fun books they have so um but be sure to Make sure with the program before, okay? Don't try to go buy books and you don't know what you need, okay? That doesn't make sense. You wanna make sure that you are looking and you are getting what you need. Books are expensive. And I do have a video out where I talk about books that I recommend. And these are some of the advanced books. These are the coding companions and the coder desk reference for procedures. So a lot more detail on those things but you really have to kind of know what it is that you're looking for because not all medical coding books are created equally. I will say that, but optin360coding.com books, wonderful resources. I will always recommend them, even though (laughs) this isn't an ad. So, (laughs) all right, but that's going to do it for me. So uh, I hope you'll take a second and um, join me on Patreon. If you're looking for some unofficial exercises where I talk about uh, coding scenarios that I come up with and I break it down and I give you guys my rationale and we do, um, what is it? Crossword puzzles and to learn medical terminology and things like that. And I talk about myself. So (laughs) I hope you'll join me there. I'll leave that link for my Patreon down in the description box below. And so if you are a medical coder, a medical coding student, somebody curious about the fascinating world of medical coding, a provider or a nurse, I invite you to like and subscribe and follow me on my journey in medical coding. I will see y'all next time. Bye.